So today on Flywire, we're going, I'm in, I'm in Cascade, Idaho, and we're going to do a little backcountry flying, or we planned on doing a little backcountry flying. You know, this is kind of one of those days where you got to realize uh, what the limitations of the situation is. One, I don't know an awful lot about it, so I'm not going to take any huge risks. And there's a mountain right over there, I think, but it's so smoky that you can't really see it. So we're not actually going to do any real backcountry flying. But uh, we're here at a little grass strip that uh, remained nameless. I'm not going to tell you uh, who or where or what it is. Well, you know it's in Cascade and it's right next to the lake. So that might tell you something. But uh, we're going to do just a little bit of flying just because uh, it's good enough. So stick with us on Flywire and check it out. Hi, I'm Scott Perdue. I'm here in Cascade, Idaho, and I'm on a little grass strip next to the Cascade Lake, or Lake Cascade, and we're not really going to go flying today because the, the smoke from the fire, forest fires is just too much uh, to see very far. Um, the visibility is not too bad, but once you go over that water, you lose horizon, and uh, you don't see the ridge line that's over there, and you can kind of barely see the ridge line behind me. So uh, Tom Gresham, who was going to, we were going to go do a little flying, He's actually going to do a little bit of pattern work here, uh, maybe one or two, and just so we can get up in the air and uh, we can say we're here. Because, you know, other than that, it's it's actually, it's beautiful. VFR is not a cloud in the sky, just a whole lot of smoke. So let's watch a few of the patterns. Tom's going to stick really close to the shoreline uh, while he does these patterns. And most of the, what the folks do here at this, at this strip is do stay over to the water very close to the shoreline and do a right-hand pattern landing going uphill and then they take off going downhill most of the time the winds allow them to, to do that for takeoff and landing pretty easy this is Tom's super cruiser bought the airplane and then found that it had a lot of mods that had been made that weren't uh, up to snuff for the 150 horsepower engine and everything so they had to do quite a bit of uh, work to get it legal and safe which is always the best idea to do so here he's coming out and he's gonna do a, a landing for us I'm trying out a new uh, 360 degree camera so we ought to see some pretty interesting footage uh, it's right next to the runway. Hopefully it'll work out. I hear a helicopter in the distance. There's a, there's a fire almost directly past where he is. Uh, I guess that's Sulphur Creek. But in that direction. There's a fire out there and they're working it with Chinooks and, and other things. Trying to contain it. Here he comes. And he's just doing a normal landing. I didn't ask him to do anything, you know, to show off for the cameras. His cameras are just here. He's doing a pattern as normal. When you try to do something uh, different and trying to show off in front of a camera or a crowd, that's when Bad things can happen, so it's better just to do things normal. It's nearly calm day. It's beautiful. Okay, that was a little bounce. And it's better not to try to make it work. Better just to go around and do it over again and uh, fix, fix the error that you made. Don't try to make it work and then ground loop it. It's a good decision. All right, I'm here with Tom Gresham in Cascade, Idaho. He's putting us up for a couple of days. And we were going to do a little backcountry flying. 
Or they say, time to spare, go by air, right? <laughs> Exactly. We are all ready to go. Yeah, well, we had an inkling that this wasn't going to happen yesterday because it started getting smokier and smokier throughout the day. But we were hoping it was going to blow out, but there's virtually no breeze. No breeze, and we have no idea where the smoke's coming from. There are fires in the air. There's some TFRs, but this could be coming in from California, Oregon, yeah. and it often does. Yeah. And then just as quickly as it comes in, it leaves. So my take is, is you know, I'm a, I'm a newbie to this whole backcountry mountain flying thing. I've flown in mountains and big airplanes, but that's got a lot of power and you're doing things totally different. It's not little airplanes and the mountains. So I'm kind of uh, tentatively feeling my way forward with this. And Tom was going to show, introduce me to all this, but uh, we woke up to that. What is your take? I'm scared when I look at this. What is yours? Well, I hear people out there flying. I mean, right now we have probably four miles viz. I'm looking across the lake. That's three miles and see a little bit further. Uh, the problem is it's indistinct. And it's kind of important to know where the ridges are when you're flying in the canyons. And the other kind part of, yeah, of it, yeah, of. kind of important, <laughs> yeah, you know. The other part of it is when you get this hazy, your depth perception is not good. Yes. Things look closer than they are or further away. I can't remember, it's one or the other, but you know, either way, it's not good. So we're not delivering the serum to save the children or anything. This is flying just for fun. So we go, yeah, I had a lot of plans here, so what? The weather didn't let you do it. Any, you know, I wouldn't go in this any more than I would in thunderstorms. Yeah, I think that's safe to say. I mean, you look up and the sun's shining and there's not a cloud in the sky, but man, it is, uh, it is very hazy. And if it was flat land where I'm used to flying, it just wouldn't really be a huge issue. But here there's big ridges that turn into mountains. And, <laughs> yes, and, they do. Yes. And, <laughs> and what we were gonna do is be fly over the ridges and then drop down into the canyons and land at the earth strips that are at the bottom of the canyons. I'm thinking that's not a good plan today. Not a not a good plan. Well, I'm I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and if it clears tomorrow, we'll go do that. Um, there are a lot of people who've kind of picked up on the whole backcountry flying. A lot of people coming to Idaho. There are things to know, and, and I'm not an expert. I just you know I've been up here a few years. I try to pay attention to the people who know what they're doing. The other thing I do is I don't try to take on a lot of challenges. Unfortunately, Fortunately, we get people who want to come up here and take on the, the toughest strips, you know, and honestly, I mean, we have, when we're sitting at 4,800 feet where we are now, the density altitude, I'm guessing right now is probably 7,500 mm -hmm. or 8,000, and that's real. I mean, it really makes a difference. I don't, if you're a flatlander, you may not have paid a lot of attention to that. Yeah, or even really seriously considered how density altitude affects Everything affects the engine, how much how much power it produces. It, per, it affects the performance of the wings and the ailerons and the elevators. And, That's a good point. Yeah. Being turbocharged helps, but it's not. It doesn't get you back to sea level performance because mm -hmm. the wings are still working on that thinner air. There just aren't as many molecules to work against. That's right. Yeah. So you know, there's that. I would, you know, my basic deal is, it's fine to come out. Love to have you come out. If you can find somebody who's experienced to fly with, that's a good thing. Uh, if you can find an instructor, there are mountain flying and canyon flying instructors. We just had a conversation this morning with Amy Hoover, who's one of the best. Love her book, by the way. Yeah, I, I, you showed it to me. I'm, I think I'm going to have to get a copy of it. But uh, you were telling me, actually, that you're planning on doing some uh, training with Amy in the, I in the Super Cruiser and the 182. I'm going to fly the 182. And, and this is my buddy's 182. Mine's over there. But, yeah, he uh, won't let him fly that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm going to fly with Amy. I think it's my idea that you ought to always be training. You always get recurrent training, trying to learn something. And she said, well, do you want to fly the 182 or the Super Cruiser? I said, well, both. I mean, if I can get a tune-up on the, the Super Cruiser and tailwheel, that'd be great, especially after those two landings I just made there. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a great, wonderful thing about tail draggers. They will teach you humil humility. You make a good one, and then the next one around, you're bouncing. You're going, where did that come from? <laughs> well, that's oh, what yeah. I totally agree with you. I I figure that, uh, you know, I've had the experience of, well, I made like two or three or five in a row that are really good, and you go, okay, finally, I've got a handle on this. And then once you say that, you make a <laughs> dozen that are terrible. Yeah, exactly. You think, I hope nobody saw that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to fly with Amy. Um, it's just a, will it be fun? Right. But it's a really good investment. 
but you know everybody ought to be getting some training regularly we get in we get complacent and we also build bad habits and i don't know how well and you could address that how well can you see your own bad habits well the trouble is, is unless you're very analytical and you think about you think about what you do and the mistakes you've made and you recognize the mistake when you're flying and you go, okay, well, what was the root cause of that mistake and fix that, mm -hmm. then you're not in the analytical mode and you don't notice it anymore. You know, it's like, a, a, what do they call it, nose blind? You know, if you, you're yeah. in a house and you get used to the, the smell and it's something bad, but you get used to it and you don't notice it anymore until somebody comes over and they go, what's that smell? Right, right. <laughs> Well, you know, the other thing is there are aspects to this canyon flying, and Amy likes to call it canyon flying as opposed to mountain flying, because we're not going over the mountains, we're dropping down and flying the canyons. There are aspects to it and things that the experienced professional pilots have worked out that you and I would go, wow, I never thought of that. You know, and simple things like, okay, we know that you reduce your turning radius by slowing down, right? And, but their deal is, look, why don't you slow down when you're flying through the canyon? You're buying yourself a lot of margin for error. Instead of flying real fast cruise speed. Yeah. You mentioned that they've, they have a new, they've come up with a V-speed? They, they call it V-Canyon. V-Canyon. Yeah. You establish what your V-Canyon speed is, and I may be able to do 130 in my 182. But out there, maybe I want to be doing 70 or 80, which is... I haven't run the numbers, but I'm guessing it reduces my turn radius by at least half. Yeah. You know, and then you hug the side of the hill. Here's the question: Is it which side do you hold? hug? Right side, left side. Generally, we want to fly right side, but if you've got thermals working for you on the left side, maybe you want to be over there as opposed to flying in a constant downdraft. Because should your engine quit, should something happen, you're giving up lift. Right. And where's the sun shining in the morning, afternoon, those kind of things. It's like. Hmm, a lot of in-tot things. I, I call it in-tot. I never thought of that. <laughs> That's not bad. It's not bad. You know, if you don't breathe, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's great fun back here. Just got to watch the weather. Um, one of the questions you get, you got a lot of people flying their carbon cubs, their super, you know, cubs, things like this. You don't need a tailwheel bush plane to fly the strips in Idaho. We have a lot of airstrips that are maintained by the Idaho uh, Department of Transportation and also the Recreational Aviation Foundation and the Idaho Aviation yeah, I noticed you're wearing one of their hats. Yeah, yeah, I'm a big supporter. And they maintain and help us maintain uh, grass strips, gravel strips throughout the country, RAF does. Uh, but a lot of these are not short. They're not these 600 foot strips, they're 2,000 feet. Uh, I mean, I think Indian Creek is 4,100 feet. I mean, you, which, which given density altitude now, in, uh, is, is actually fairly short. It is, <laughs> but but at the same time, yeah. you can do it in 182 right. easily. Galen Hanselman, who wrote the book Fly Idaho, which if you can grab a copy of that, is a two-volume set. It is the Bible for flying back here. He went and look, not only did he look at every airstrip, he actually surveyed. He went and learned how to survey. Wow. It has the, the survey on each one of the airstrips with little notes about it. Fly Idaho. It's fun to just sit there and flip through it and look at the strips. But all that to say that he did all of that in a stock 182. Oh, no kidding. 0470, no big wheels, flew into all these places. Equipment is good. Pilot technique is much better. Yeah, they're, they're a really fantastic, uh, high-performing backcountry kind of airplane, like a carbon cub, it doesn't make up for poor pilot technique. See it all the time. They're, they helicopter those out of the backcountry a lot. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, there are places back there, you know, it's wilderness area. You know, you can't get a truck to it. You're gonna have to pay, somebody's got to pay to get a helicopter. I can only imagine out. that's, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to do Easily, that. easily. Yeah. yeah, I know we got insurance, but still, let's not do that. Let's not do that. And that's not even counting on the fact that you could get hurt. People get hurt back there. You know, another thing, we've talked about this before, um, you, you need to have a survival kit. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly in the winter, you'll think about that, but like right now, if we were out there and got, you know, we had to put down somewhere, and we're okay. But you better have some water. It's gonna hit 90 degrees here today. Uh, maybe some signaling devices. 
most people I know around here travel with a, uh, a Garmin inReach or a Spot. I, you know, you know me, I like belt and suspenders, so I carry a, a Garmin inReach and a PLB. I want two different devices working on two different systems. When I need help, I want the cavalry to come. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you want to be prepared. You were Boy Scout, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> You were too, weren't you? I was, yes. Of course. I mean, you got that be prepared thing. You can't get rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I wish we could take you out there today, but... Well, it, it, uh, it's actually fun to, to be out here. Unless, I mean, it's so quiet. It's really pretty even with the smoke. Uh, but to watch you fly and be able to see that, it was good to, good to see that. We'll try to do that. You know, and, oh, you know what? There's a great resource. I mean, obviously, your channel on YouTube is a great resource. But there are a lot of videos of flying into these strips. And there's a great value, I think, in watching the video and say, okay, at this point, this is where I need to be. At this point, like if you go look up flying into Cabin Creek, there's a couple of rocks, big rocks. You need your wing to be going right by those rocks. And then you're set up. If you're too high, you know, it's not a good place to try to go around. You can actually have flown into these things by watching these over and over again. Well, that's a, that's actually, a, I think, a really good idea. It's like chair flying, you know. When I when I did pilot training, they uh, they said, okay, we want you to go and we want you to chair fly this. Just run through it like and like you're doing it for real. Make your movements and mm -hmm. do it. Talk to yourself and all that, just like you're doing it. Just don't pay any attention to anybody laughing at you, you know. But uh, it makes a difference when you chair fly it. You get more familiar with it. Well, and, the sports uh, psychologists tell us that that pre visualization, skiers running the slope in their head, doing all that. It's almost the same as having done it. You're putting it into your head. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I think it's a great idea. And the videos we have now, and we, everybody's shooting videos and going into these places. You go, okay, that's what it looks like. So you set up the same kind of a deal. Again, the, the problem is just don't bite off more than you can chew. Little pieces at a time. Um, that's the key. Don't be in a hurry. There's, there's the, a, the idea is... Is uh, it's it's for fun. We want to do it for fun, so we want to survive, so we can do it tomorrow, the next day. There's a thing that happens out here, and Idaho is kind of the central. Idaho and Utah, central places with the backcountry flying right now. Uh, it's called strip bagging, where people want to get as many of the strips as they can on their list. Just be careful about that, because that can lead you into one more, one more. We'll go into this one. I've made the other ones fine, so I should be okay in this one. Not necessarily, just, you know, it's, you can go into the easy ones and have just as much fun as the hard ones. Well, that and there's the precedent when you're push, pushing too hard and you don't realize it's how tired you're getting and how much that affects your judgment. And you might have done fine on five, but number six is hmm. you're a little bit tired and you're a little bit late catching the cues that uh, would have prevented you from having That's the next. That's an interesting point, that whole concept of the duty day mm -hmm. or fatigue. It's very dry out here. You get dehydrated and you don't know that you're slowing down a little bit you know but you know back to the idea of you know a survival kit water lots of water shelter uh fire building equipment some say firearm i mean you know me i'm a gun guy yes or no your call i'm not sure it's going to do you any good out there especially if you have a signal device they're going to come get you you know mm -hmm. We, we may have bears, but they're not that hungry. They're not mean bears? They're not mean bears. We have nice cuddly they're bears. They're yogi bears they're looking yeah, for. Yeah, that's them. right, teddy bears. Teddy bears, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think of, you know, without being able to go back there, if you were going to practice to come out here, slow flight, slow flight, slow flight. You know, be very, very comfortable flying with a stall warning going off. Not just a blip, but just with that thing just hollering at you. Making turns, doing stuff. If Making not, turns, climbs and descents. Yeah. Things if, like that. If you're not comfortable, go find a CFI to go with you. Uh, because, I mean, I would say that majority of accidents are people landing too fast. You know, now we're bouncing or we're running off the end or all sorts of ugly things happen. And when you're on speed, the stuff's not too difficult, really. But uh, stalls. People go, oh, I haven't done a stall since my private training. I'm sorry. If you're flying by yourself and not just having fun, you ought to be doing stalls all the time, right? Yeah, well, you know I like stalls. Oh, yeah. I like stalls and spins. But you're crazy. So, I you, know, it's, <laughs> you also like flying this way, too. You know? I do. Well, not for long, but. 
<laughs> so, but yeah, just trying to think of uh, the things that can help. Um, all that's great. I would just tell you my personal thing. There are big fly-ins out here. <clears throat> I avoid them. Avoid them, yeah. I do. Because all the, all the people that are running into the pattern and not necessarily doing a very good job of it. Yep, and a lot of them may be new, may not be comfortable out here. And so, for instance, when Johnson Creek has a big fly-in, I just make sure I don't go into Johnson Creek. Everybody goes, oh, it's really fun. Great, I got it, I understand. I mean, it's not like I'm afraid of crowds. We've flown into Oshkosh a number of times. It's just a different situation. It's one of those, yeah, there's no controller, there's no organized system. Uh, I don't know. We just have to figure out what our tolerance level is, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and, and approach it in a, approach expanding your envelope in a controlled manner. Right. So you don't hang your, hang your butt out. You want to talk about this Super Cruiser? Tell me about your Super Cruiser, yeah. Right. It's not a Super Cub. It is not a Super Cub. It's a Piper Super Cruiser, a PA-12. It's a three-place Cub. One in the front, two in the back. Now, these are two 1947-sized people. Skinny people. <laughs> yeah, skinny people. Uh, but that's what it is. Um, this one's been upgraded. It's got a 150-horse uh, engine and no flaps. They can put flaps on them aftermarket. This does not have flaps. It didn't come with flaps. It's pretty simple. Doesn't have a lot in it. We uh, bought it with my uh, my buddy Mike. We partnered on this one. I went back to Maine last year, about as far east and north as you can go in Maine, and flew it to Idaho by way of Albuquerque. Oh, that makes sense. It's not direct. <laughs> but there was this big, huge system over the plains, and we were all, I was going around it at the fabulous average speed of 81 miles an hour. <laughs> It's like you can drive that on the freeway. I, I was being passed up by semis all the time. But it was great fun, you know, put, putting around in this. It's a 1947 model. Um, people say, well, you know, aviation is too expensive. You can buy one of these for about the price or less than the price of a new SUV. Or even a dolled up pickup truck now. Dolled up pickup trucks are pushing sixty, seventy thousand yeah, dollars 70000 For that, you can get an airplane. You get a nice airplane. Uh, and I know the market's gone crazy and airplane prices are up, but you can, and tons of fun. I always said I wouldn't, uh, I would never partner with somebody. And then I got a neighbor, and we're good friends, it's Mike Gromit, and people may have seen some of his videos flying. I kind of figured out, you know the deal about having a cub type plane is, if you come out and the plane's gone, just sit down and have a Coca-Cola. It'll be back. You know, yeah, you're not going to fly for an hour. Not going far. Yeah. You know. If he is, he'll let me know. It's not a problem, and that worked out. So one of these in a partnership makes it really affordable. They don't burn much gas. So, That's nice. Yeah, it's good yeah. to have an airplane you can just go up and have fun with for a little bit. Right, yeah. it is. You pick your days, go out at dawn, you know, do that kind of thing, or right at dusk. It's kind of fun. I had a, a buddy of mine who had a champ, and... Uh, he would fly low. He said, yeah, he says, I fly low over people with their barbecues. I can tell where they're cooking. <laughs> tell whether, when they cut their grass. Oh, yeah, you can't. Yeah. It smells good. Yeah. You know? And this one you can fly with the window open. Now, it does not have the cub doors where you can flop them down and fly with the doors open, although people do put that on. Now, they'll take a $50,000 Super Cruiser and make it a $150,000 Super Cruiser. That's fine. Yeah. You know? It's a, as we say, fortunately, it's a problem you can throw money at. <laughs> That's the aviation way. That is, it? yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, tell me about your grass strip. This is the coolest place. And I, I looked on the uh, sectional, and it's not even on the sectional. What, what strip? What strip? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I said in my intro is I'm not telling you where this is. <laughs> it is a, it's a grass strip. It's part of a development here. Right. And it's uh, basically it's owned by the development, the pilots and everybody here. Uh, just about 3,000 feet grass next to a lake. It's, um, you know, not on the sectional. Not Actually, we're having that discussion now is do we want it on the sectional? Just and people mark private. Would come. Well, you mark private, people still drop in. Um, because of the nature of being a development, you don't want a lot of people coming in and doing training here and all of that. So as of right now, it's just not, it's not here. It's invisible. But uh, it was my big draw to come here when I'm, I bought a place here five years ago 
And then about seven days ago, we moved here permanently. <laughs> We've been coming up from Louisiana back and forth. Big and change from Louisiana. It is just like Louisiana, except for everything. <laughs> <laughs> except for the weather, the temperature, the, the humidity. humidity. Yeah, the, feet, the hurricanes. 12, 12 feet of snow here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Instead of hurricanes, you have snow. We do. 12 we do feet of snow. 12 feet of snow. 10 to 12 feet in a season. And we'd spend all that winter here, so we're, we're comfortable with that. Uh, but it's a lovely place. Idaho's a wonderful place. Uh, you have to tell them what we saw when we were setting up the camera tour, what flew by us. Oh yeah, we were, we were setting up the cameras and uh, saw this big bird fly by the trees there just on the other side of the runway. It turned out to be an eagle with uh, his prey, bald eagle with his prey, and we couldn't quite tell what it was. It I wasn't a fish, I think it was another bird. Oh, might have been. Yeah. yeah. Because it didn't look like a fish. Mm -mm. It was, you know, but we see bald eagles here. We got deer walking by. We have elk walk by. That airstrip that's about uh, 50 yards from us right there had a moose walk up on me there. <laughs> a moose right here. That's cool. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, we're having fun now. So it's kind of like when I lived in Alaska and I would run into two things. It actually relates to flying. Two things. When I lived in Alaska, I always heard people say, I always wanted to go to Alaska. And when people find out that you're a pilot, what do people say? I've always wanted to learn to fly. And my answer very quickly became, then do it. Then do it. And they say, well, I'm too old. And I say, well, you're not dead yet. You're not never too, too old. old. You're not too old. When you're older, you know a lot more about how you learn. Mm -hmm. And you may have to go through, we talked about this earlier, you may have to go through two or three CFIs, instructors, to find one who meshes with you. There's nothing wrong with that. No. Doesn't mean that's a bad instructor, it just means that person doesn't get you. Uh, but you know how you learn. You have, frankly, probably more available income. You, are, you don't have to space out your lessons because you can't afford it. Spacing out your lessons is one of the most expensive things you can do, right? It really is. It's a, it, what happens is you don't have the proficiency you know, you if you fly three times a week, then you're not, you're only relearning a little bit of what you flew a couple of days ago. But if you fly once a week or more, a bigger time frame in between, you spend more than half of the time that you fly trying to relearn what you forgot from the previous time you flew. Yeah. So it's very small amounts of progress. Yeah. So yeah, proficiency in flying is everything. But people say, you know, I've always wanted to learn to fly. And it's, it's not a flippant response to say, well, if you truly, really always wanted to, then do it. And they say, well, I don't know how. I said, well, look, I, if you don't even know if it's right for you, every flight school will do the introductory flight. Yeah. You, and, and when you do an intro flight, you're sitting in the left seat and you're flying the airplane. You know, and if you do that and you go, that was great. I never want to do that again. That's okay. Yeah. You did that. You did that. And you had the courage to do that. Or you may go, damn, this is I awesome. I really like this. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, that's what happened to me. And I, I, I told my wife when I was living in Alaska many years ago, I said, you know, I've always wanted to fly. And I've got a great wife. She says, well, then go fly. Just simple as that. Simple went, as that. Okay. So let's talk about that. Uh, you, you grew up as an outdoorsman, you know, hunting, fishing, uh, camping, all that kind of stuff, doing, doing a lot of stuff outdoors. Then... You moved to Alaska to do more of that, and you're you're writing for a magazine at the time. Yeah, I was editing Alaska Magazine. Alaska Magazine. So, was it the flying environment of Alaska that got you interested? Or? Well, that's interesting. Yes, I got up there, and everybody's flying. I said, "Boy, we'd really love to fly." And then I was just looking at all the reports. It's like, crash, crash, crash. We got a much higher percentage of the population who's flying. So you start to have people out on the edges of the bell curve, maybe people that possibly shouldn't be flying. And as I kept reading them, and I know it sounds arrogant, but I just looked at it and said, you know, a lot of these people are doing things that I wouldn't do. They're putting themselves into situations that I wouldn't do right? because I'm, I'm risk averse when it comes to that. And so after about a year of that, I said, you know, because I was thinking Alaska's a terrible place to fly. And then I realized, no, you just got a lot more people. I mean, it's like five times the number per thousand or whatever it is in Alaska that are flying. And they use them in a different way. They use them like pickup trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, but so anyway, I went ahead and signed up and took lessons and it took me a while. I you know, was chasing that while I was working, same deal. Uh, bought a, weirdly enough, a 1947 
tail dragger. I got a Luscom, made the same year as, well, there were a lot of planes made in 1947. Yes. Because the, uh, the airplane makers in 46, 47 were sure that all the pilots coming back from the war would want to buy an airplane. A lot of them never wanted to get in an airplane again because they'd been to war and there was planes. Yeah. And when you look back, man, Taylor Craft, Piper, Air Coop, Cessna. Uh, Cessna, I mean, yeah. ton, well, a lot of them are not here anymore. They've made planes for two, three, four years, gone. Yeah. So, but, they, but anyway, just interesting that I had a, my first plane was a 1947. Paid $6,000 for that plane. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It'd be hard to find a Luskin for six grand now. Or anything, yeah. <laughs> a set of tires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not that it's that expensive. It's not. Uh, well, like I said, this can cost you about what a car does, and sips gas. Mm -hmm. Not to say that flying doesn't cost money, you know, but I have come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as an inexpensive hobby. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Is it golf? Is it scuba diving? You, you know. will put whatever your available income is into that thing. I mean, I know people who collect stamps. I mean, I know a guy's got probably a million dollars worth of stamps. Not my thing. Not my thing. I'd rather have a million dollars worth of airplane Ooh, stuff. Yeah. Could okay. you imagine? Have a lot of fun. Yeah, that'll get you uh, al almost a turboprop. <laughs> Not quite. Well, that's about a half a Mustang. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. If I won the lottery, that's what I'd, I'd buy. Yeah, well, the, uh, but there are, it's interesting, there are some really interesting developments. This outfit uh, up in Yakima, Washington, uh, Cub Crafters, making fabulous airplanes. They do make nice airplanes. I mean, but they're pricey. They are pricey. You well, can pay about four fifty, four hundred fifty thousand for a Cub, or you can find you a used Cub for fifty to one hundred fifty thousand. Your choice. Your choice. Yeah. yeah. What is it you want to do, and how well equipped do you want it to be? I'm going to spin all the way back to save a bunch of your money for training. Um, just because you got the license doesn't mean you're good. We see it all the time. Get and go get training from different people. Yeah, you got to have different perspectives. And one person, uh, as uh, however good a pilot they are, that's still that one perspective. And uh, they, they even if they might be able to teach you something, then it doesn't mean they can continue to expand your your knowledge. Also, there are a lot of really good pilots who can't teach. Yes. Different skill set. Yeah, there's a lot of instructors that can't teach either, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's another video for you at some point. <laughs> when you really want to tick people off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Like, there's some of the YouTube guys out there that don't mind doing that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. So, um, oh, we should mention, we actually got together by doing video a long time ago. We did, but we were friends well, before that. Long before that, yeah. basically online in the, the original online chat group. It was called AVSIG, Aviation yeah. Special Interest Group. Yeah, it was on uh, on CompuServe, and it was it's the and it's still in existence. It's not as big as it used to be, but it's still in existence. So it's the oldest continuous uh, chat forum on the internet. About mid eighties. Yeah, I, I want to say like eighty five, eighty four, something yeah, like that. That that's, sounds right. That's about when I stumbled onto it. Right. So we did that, and then. We got together at Oshkosh, camped together with a group of our friends, and then when I decided to do a TV show about aviation, I called you and said, you want to go? And you said, yeah. Yeah, that's Wings to Adventure. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately, you can't find it. Find a little bit out there on YouTube, but uh, otherwise they're not rerunning the, pre the uh, show, which is a shame. Yeah, we did t four seasons, two years, uh, 52 episodes. We flew everywhere and flew everything. It was the original HD cameras. We were laughing because our cameras were hundred grand. The viewfinder was ten thousand. Lenses are extra on that, and we were one of the very first outfits shooting HD. And now we're shooting on telephones. Our cell phones are four K. Yeah, my iPhone twelve is uh, Pro Max has got it better 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 than the cameras we used then. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, but we did a lot. We shot uh, stabilized gyro stabilized camera mounts out of your a a36 shooting out of my a36 took the back doors off and then you flew what did you figure 70 different airplanes something like that to do Type, different types of airplanes yeah. i know i just flew this camera plane and gunny would come in and lock in and we'd go do our thing we'd go round in circles yeah it was a hoot 
It was a good time. That's where I learned something interesting. We were actually at Oshkosh. We were, uh, man, it was beating us up and the thermals were, were doing this. And it's, you can't get good air to air when you're doing that. And we just went out over the lake. Yeah, because the Rocks water the water goes. That actually, we it was it, it was at Oshkosh, but it wasn't during Oshkosh. Right. Yeah, it was. We were up there. I think it was in May. Right. And we were doing the shoot, and there's still some snow on the ground. Back. In <laughs> yeah, and it, but you got over the land, you got yeah. uneven heating. Yeah, and in the on the water, you actually were sinking. The air was yeah. sinking. So. It, but it's all even, the same temperature over the water. So, if you are close to a lake and you're getting beat up, slide out over the water, smooth out your ride. Yeah, that was good. Yeah. yeah, good stuff. Okay, I got to tell a story on you. Uh oh. So we were doing a, a flight with uh, with Gunny at Oshkosh. I can't remember. It was Airwolf? Oh, the Airwolf. Yeah, the yeah. M twenty six. Yeah, jumped in that thing. We're flying out, and he's talking to air traffic control, and uh, you probably don't even remember this. No, he's not striking a bell. And they they call traffic like you know at uh, three o'clock, and he went got the traffic, and I'm going. And you said, when you're a fighter pilot, if I don't see him that fast, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's that. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and also you got you cheat. You got fighter pilot eyesight too. Well, I did then. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah, I know. But I mean, it makes a huge difference. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, and 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 what really is is it's how you look. What I mean, how you look for what you're looking for, because look. when we're sitting here on the ground. Uh, you look at an airplane, you can see the airplane, but that's not how it looks in the air. What you're looking for is movement mm. and contrast. Right. That's what you're looking for. And then you can see the speck. And then all of a sudden, when you see that, boom, it pops out in, in your focus. And that's the other thing is, is the human eye has a tendency to focus, you know, maybe two to three feet in front of your face. Mm. So what you can't do is expect to look around the sky and see something because you're focused close it's just natural that's who that's it's the way we're wired right so if you want to look and see something far you have to look far focus and then look interesting yeah. okay and the other thing i remember i think you may have taught it to me the first time is if you see a plane out there if it's moving across your windscreen you're not going to hit it mm -hmm. if it's stationary you got a problem well people who aren't pilots can use that too if you're driving on the interstate and there's a car merging on the on-ramp if it stays in the exact same place, you're going to hit it. Yeah. You're going to hit it. It needs to be moving forward and moving back in your window over there. Yeah. So I, I've used that a lot. Shut up. <laughs> I think being a fighter pilot's a metaphor for life. <laughs> yeah, some of them we can't repeat. <laughs> <laughs> Not in polite company, at least. There you go. And, yeah. we, and we don't hang around with polite company anyway, yeah. so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So if you want to see Wings to Adventure, uh, you're going to have to support me on Patreon because I release... Uh, I don't re release it on, on Patreon. Um, <laughs> they don't exist. <laughs> they don't exist. But if you support me on Patreon, you might be able to see one or two episodes. There you go. And I'll leave a link below so uh, you can make that choice if you like. So. Good deal. I'm so glad you came out. Well, I am too. Even uh, even with this, it's a lot of fun, and and uh, I'm just having a great time. It's. Uh, you think this is hot? I just came from Texas, and we're flirting with 100 degrees. So this is well, yeah. It was ninety degrees, it's got, but it'll be going down to about fifty-six tonight. Yeah, and we'll be sleeping with the windows open. So. And the humidity count is like twenty points less than it is back. Oh home. yeah, huge difference. So, exactly. Huge difference. It's it awesome. So okay, you can help me push this thing back into the parking place. Yeah, we'll help you tie it down. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks a bit like this here. And these are my Patreons, and Patreon supporters. I appreciate that. Like I said, I'll leave a link below. And if you'd like to help, do that. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.